Hello, welcome back to another episode of From Prison to the Streets. I'm Eric, I did 11 years in prison, and I talk about prison stuff. Today I'm continuing my story, my story where I'm telling you about my journey through the prison system in the state of Kansas. Where I left off, I told you about where I joined a gang, and I was in the gang for about a year, actually less than a year, but whatever, and I got out of it. And I started doing positive things again, and I got my minimum custody. So be sure to like and subscribe. We are talking about that today. That meaning minimum custody. So, yeah. All right, so minimum custody. I should start off by telling you guys a little bit about security levels in the Kansas prison system and how that works. I'm not going to give you the full rundown on it, but just a few details to kind of help you make sense of some things that I'm going to be talking about here. In the state of Kansas, when you first go to prison, you go to RDU. It is a diagnostics unit. It's where they give you an evaluation and they assess what programs you need to take to be uh, rehabilitated and to reintegrate successfully upon your release. And they also determine your risk for reoffending and they determine your security level. There are several factors that play into an individual's security level. Your age, the severity level of your crime, whether you are in a gang, um, your behavior, all of that plays an important role in your security level. In Kansas, we tend to also call it custody level, not just security level. And usually we won't say like maximum security prison or something like that. We'll say max custody. In Kansas, you have super max, max, high medium, low medium, and minimum custody. When I left RDU, I was high medium security. So, or high medium custody. I'm going to use those two words interchangeably in this, in this video, but I was high medium. And that was where I was at for a while until I got in trouble in Ellsworth. They made me max custody and then they didn't have bed space for me in the medium side or in the max side, I should say in El Dorado when I got there. So they made me high medium by exception when I got to El Dorado. Over time, I gradually went down in points in my security points to where I was low medium. And then in 2015, I got my minimum. And that's just the prison system. I was in county jail before that for almost a year. And when I was in county jail, I was in a max custody pod. Now, in some places, they will call that a felony pod or an ag pod or something like that. But in Kansas or the place that I was at, I should say, we just called it the max pod. And so we'll just go with that. But the takeaway there is from 2007 till late 2015, I was either max or medium. I had never set foot in a minimum facility before. And so in November 2015, an officer told me, I believe it was my unit team actually, they told me that I had made minimum custody and I was on the drop sheet, which is basically a uh, a piece of paper that says who's transferring the next day. But they told me that I was on the drop sheet for the next day, that I was going to Winfield Correctional Facility. That night, they had to pack up my property. Typically in the state of Kansas, you are allowed to have two boxes of property. All of your property has to fit in two boxes and it needs to be within certain limits. You have a limitation on a lot of things. You know, you can have 50 photographs, you can have 10 letters, um, you can have 12 books, one primary religious text and a dictionary and a thesaurus. And there's other limitations too. Those are just the ones that I can remember off the top of my head. I was pretty much over my limit on everything because when you're in prison for a long time, you accumulate stuff. It's kind of the law of the jungle. You know, you get all you can and you can all you get because you never know when you're going to need that stuff. And so you just accumulate. It was against the rules, but officers didn't mess with me very often. And 
usually if they were messing with me, I had been in the system for long enough at that point that I had ways that I could mess with them back. And they pretty much just leave, you know, they pretty much just left me alone. <clears throat> so they go to inventory and pack up all my stuff. That's another thing. They have to inventory your property. They don't just throw it in a box. They have to write down everything that you have. And I had so much stuff, it took them forever to do it pretty much all night, and they still didn't have an inventory the next day. The next day, they called me over to uh, A&D for transport. I made another video on prison transports. If you'd like to check that out, you can, but I'll give you a few details on what a typical medium custody transport or a max custody transport is like versus what happened to me that day. Usually, on a medium or max transport you're going to be on a bus you are going to be in a jumpsuit you are going to have handcuffs belly chains and leg irons leg irons are pretty much just handcuffs with a really big chain in the middle that they put on your ankles a belly chain literally just goes around your belly through belt loops in your jumpsuit and then your handcuffs will attach to a d-ring on your belly chain and then your Leg irons will also be connected to the belly chains by another chain that runs down. So, you know, you're, you're fairly secure. And the bus, you know, you can't see out of it that well. There's usually two armed guards from the special security team there. And you're usually transported with a bunch of people. That is not what happened to me at all when I went to the minimum facility. I got to A&D, they said, you're staying in your blues, but we do have to handcuff you, and that's pretty much it. So, blue button-down shirt, blue jeans, hands cuffed in front of me, and that was it. They put me on a van, not a bus. I was the only prisoner on the van. I had one guard. It was a brown suit. It was not a special security team member. He was armed, I believe. I believe he had a sidearm that he picked up from the shack on the way out of prison. Guards don't typically have guns inside the fences. They can have a gun in the guard tower, but they can't have a gun inside the fences otherwise. Uh, so they have to pick up their, their sidearms on their way out. But that was it, you know. Um, and I'm not even positive he had a sidearm. Anyway, so we drove out to Winfield. And the drive, to be honest, was very unsettling for me because I hadn't been in a vehicle since 2008. I hadn't moved, you know, in a vehicle since 2008. So I got a little bit motion sick and I was very overwhelmed. You know, I could see all this scenery. I'd been in the same place since 2008. I hadn't been anywhere else. I'd been sitting in that prison. So being able to look out the window and watch the scenery go by, see the trees and the hills and the creeks and stuff being a country boy you know that kind of that kind of spoke to me and it was a lot to take in it was very surreal maybe even more surreal than getting out of prison because when i got out of prison i was kind of numb at that point i don't remember how long the drive was it seemed like forever in reality it was probably not more than an hour i don't know exactly how far away winfield is from el dorado but we get there, and Winfield Correctional Facility used to be a mental hospital. I think it dates back to the late 1800s, maybe the mid-1800s. But it's a very, very old facility composed of several old hospital buildings that are made out of stone, limestone, that are several stories tall. And there are also a few brick buildings on site. And it sits on top of a, a great big hill out in the country. And, you know, we were driving up and there were no real fences, no razor wire, no guard towers, nothing like that. And El Dorado, when you roll up on El Dorado, like you have huge fences, big rolls of wire going down. Like it's not razor wire just across the top. It's all the way down the fence. And you have guard towers everywhere with guards in the towers armed with 243s 
And that's not what Winfield was like. It kind of looked like a hospital, an old one, but it, it kind of looked like a hospital. So we get up there and there's a, I guess I would call it a, um, a cul-de-sac. And all the, the cell houses, all the buildings kind of face this cul-de-sac. So we pull in and we stopped in front of A and D slash property, which was a little brick building that was probably one of the newer buildings there. We stopped there. The officer took my cuffs off, handed some paperwork to the officer that was at A and D. And he said, hey, best of luck to you. And he took off. Now, at this time, I learned that my property did not come with me from El Dorado. It took them so long to inventory it and go through it that it did not make it over to A&D. It was sitting up at the property department in El Dorado. So my property was still over in El Dorado. And the property officer at uh, Winfield, the A&D slash property officer who was there at the time, said, Hey, look, your property isn't here. It was a holiday weekend. It was, um, it was coming up on Thanksgiving. So they weren't going to have my property there probably until next week sometime. And I was just so happy to be there. I'm like, all right, cool. You know, whatever. I wasn't even tripping on it. A lot of inmates would throw a fit about that. They would start losing their shit. I didn't care. I was just happy to be at minimum and be out of El Dorado with all the chaos and stuff. I didn't know exactly what to expect from a minimum facility. I'd heard things, you know, I heard it was wide open, that you could pretty much just do whatever you wanted. But in prison, you kind of, you know, don't believe anything you hear and half of what you see. You can't really trust people's word. People make up, you know, a lot of shit. So it's hard to, to decipher truth from what's bullshit. Anyway, so I, I wasn't putting my own expectations there. I was just going to let it be what it was, and I was going to see for myself, good or bad. And what was cool, A&D is also where they, it, you know, they issued new clothes to guys that were coming into that facility. And my buddy... Mitch, who had been in El Dorado several years prior, was there. He had gotten his minimum, and he had gone to Winfield. So I knew him, and I had to get some new clothes because I was wearing my blue button down, and that was not the uniform standard for Winfield. They had blue jeans and kind of like a, a gray T-shirt. So I needed to get that. And I also needed some shower shoes because my shower shoes were in El Dorado and you don't want to walk around in prison showers barefoot. It's not advisable at all. Mitch was there. He said, hey, man, you know, I work laundry. I've got brand new shirts here. We can get you set up with new shirts. I can get you a new set of boots. What size boots you wear? It was real cool. However, I did get the wrong size boot, which is going to become important later in this story. It's... It's kind of dumb that I got the wrong size boot, but it's not unexpected at all in prison because the clothing sizes are always off and they're not very consistent. You might one day get a, a pair of size 12 boots being a size 12 and you'll end up with something that's like a size 13 or 14 or you'll go for something that's 11 and a half and you'll get a size 10 in reality. It might be labeled 11 and a half, but it's not. It kind of sucks, but the boots are made by inmates, so, you know, or they were at that time anyway. Anyway, Mitch hooked me up with some clothes, and then I had to get shower shoes from Mrs. Glover, who was the property officer there. Now, Miss Glover was not the regular property officer. She was a stand-in for um, another dude. I'm not going to say his name because he's a vengeful bastard, and he might try to get me on a defamation of character suit. But anyway, Miss Glover was going to give me some shower shoes as loners. And when she did that, she started to put my name and number on them. And I said, hey, I actually ordered a pair of shower shoes on Canteen, which I did. And 
So if my canteen is going to be here next week, I don't see the point in marking my name on those shower shoes. Might as well just leave A and D on them because they were marked, you know, A and D. Um, so I said, you might as well leave A and D on them and go ahead and be able to issue those to someone else when someone else comes in. She said, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Mitch was nice enough to show me to my cell house. It was B2 cell house. So B building, the buildings there, the old hospital buildings were lettered and the number designated what floor you were going to be on. So I was on B2. It was two flights of steps up, you know, two flights of steps per story. And I went up there, checked in with the officer, and he showed me to my bunk. I was in a four-man cube. The facility there was set up a lot like U-Dorm in El Dorado. It was, you know, divided into dorms, open dorms, not cells, and those dorms were broken into four man cubicles. So you'd have like a little partition between each group of four guys. You have two bunks on one side, two bunks on the other, and then you had lockers. So I got there, I got settled in and something happened with my property. I, it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And the same thing happened with my shower shoes kept getting delayed. So I didn't see shower shoes or my property for, months essentially uh, before I got all of it you know and that kind of becomes important later in this story as well but the first week I was I was there I was assigned a job I was assigned to the canal route so at 6 six thirty in the morning around there I had to go check in at one of the at one of the buildings out back and we would all load into a van and we would head to Wichita and we would be in this van with one security officer and we would basically pick up trash along the highway in Wichita along 235, along the interstate, I should say. And it was a really cool job. It was pretty easy. And some days when we weren't super busy, if we had all the trash picked up and we also cut brush and if we had all of that stuff done, then our boss would just drive us around Wichita. We would just cruise, essentially. And nobody treated us like inmates. Everybody just assumed we were a road crew or free people or whatever. And they treated us accordingly if we stopped at a gas station or something like that. It was really cool. I really enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, we were working for DOT out of Wichita. And that Christmas, they invited us to the Christmas party. So we went into the Department of Transportation office there in Wichita. We sat down with them. They had catering from Hog Wild Pit Barbecue in Wichita. And it was great food. It was awesome. And the people were awesome. You know, free world people are different from prison people. You know, they have that, I don't know, innocence about them. They're crispy. <laughs> uh, but they treated us normally, and that was really nice. It was really cool. It was very refreshing. I ended up changing jobs, though. I switched over to a maintenance job where I was the only mason at the facility. When I left El Dorado, I left with a certification in masonry because I graduated from the program there. And all those buildings in Winfield are pretty much brick or stone and they didn't have any masons there they had carpenters and it's kind of funny because to start out with they didn't even have a position for a mason they just had positions for carpenters so I started out in the carpentry department and then they created a position for a mason and that was my spot it was cool I had like a little side by side and a tool bag and every morning I would have a clipboard with work orders all around the facility and so I'd check out the tools that I needed, put them in my bag, hop in the side by side and go to different work calls. And that was my job. It was really cool, but I didn't enjoy it that much. I didn't get paid much. I was getting paid like 60 cents a day and it was hard work. Masonry is not easy. It's very uh, physically demanding. So I didn't really enjoy that aspect of it. 
and the boots that I had were the wrong size. They were a little bit too small, and I had to go get new boots. And when I went to go get new boots, the regular property officer was back, and he gave me all sorts of trouble about getting new boots. You know, he was like, hey, you know, you took these boots knowing they were the wrong size and they were brand new and now I can't give them to anybody else. So, you know, he was just being very combative about it. And I said, look, man, I'm sorry. I didn't realize they were the wrong size. They were labeled my size, but, you know, they don't fit. And he's like, no, no, that's not it. Your mommy just didn't teach you to, to tell what size shoe you wore. Now, I know that might not seem like a significant remark to a lot of people. There's some things that you don't do in prison, especially as a correctional officer. You don't talk about people's family. That's just a no-no. You don't do that. You know, we have a, I don't know, some sort of understanding. You know, I, I'm not going to be unduly familiar with you. You need to treat me the same way. You have to maintain a little bit of professionalism there. And the moment you start talking about my family or what my mama taught me or how my mama raised me, I'm going to take issue with that. <clears throat> and so we got into an argument and I ended up, instead of just flat out going off on the guy, I ended up filing a formal grievance against him. The formal grievance procedure in the Kansas prison system isn't really good for much. It is pretty much what it sounds like. It's a formality. You know, you file a grievance, you basically describe the situation, and you send it to your unit team. They review it, and they either, you know, put a write-up in the officer's file, which almost never happens, or what is more likely to happen, they write you a, a thing back, a disposition on the grievance, saying that, you know, it's tough shit. I filled out a grievance on the guy. I sent it in. And it turns out that he was actually related to my unit team manager. So nothing happened. But I am kind of relating this story to kind of give you some context for what would happen later. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about minimum facilities. I'm going to tell you straight up, I didn't like that facility. I didn't like minimum one bit. The people there suck. Uh, the other inmates, the other prisoners, they act like they're super tough when they're only doing 90 day PVs or little small time drug charges and stuff like that. And I don't like the whole tough guy attitude. I really don't. You know, that stuff doesn't fly in higher security prisons because if you act tough, somebody's going to try you out. That's just going to happen. And it's not like that in minimum because guys have a lot more to lose. You know, they're not going to haul off and stab someone because they're going home in six months or a year or 90 days. The sentences aren't very long for guys who are there. So they act a fool because there's no consequences for it. The officers are the same way. The officers act super tough and they're very disrespectful, not as a whole, but generally, you know, they're not all like that, but most of them were. They weren't very respectful. They acted like hard asses because they were used to dealing with inmates who had something to lose. If you're in a higher security facility, you're dealing with guys who have all day, you know, they might have 25 years of life. They might have life without parole. Even if they have 10 or 15 years, that's a long time. And if one of those guys are having a bad day, you know, there could be consequences to that. Officers can take TVs from inmates. They can put inmates in the hole. You know, they can give them write-ups and stuff. But 
if an inmate decides to go outside the accepted behavior for that facility, and which a lot of inmates who are doing life, they don't give a fuck about the rules. I'm sorry for my language, but that's how it is. A lot of them don't care. And you might be able to take their TV away, but they can take your life away. And that's scary. And officers will treat you with a little bit more respect in higher security facilities because of that. They're aware of that. They're not trying to create a hostile environment for themselves or their coworkers. And that's not a bad thing. That's smart. A lot of times the best way to avoid a conflict is to not start a conflict. So I'm in this place. I didn't like my job. I didn't like the facility. I didn't like the people there. I didn't have a lot of friends. Um, I will tell you about some of the activities that we had there. Uh, you know, every hour on the hour, we could move throughout the prison. We could go to the library at the top of every hour. So when it rolled over to 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock or whatever it was, we would have 10 or 15 minutes where we could move to the library or we could go to the weight pit. We could go to the yard. We could go to a building they called the Fern. In the Fern, they had pool tables. They had guitars. And probably the only redeeming quality of that facility is that they had guitars. And, you know, you were there after that 15 minute window closed. You were there until the next hour, you know, the top of the next hour. Then you can move around. There were some activities, but in reality, I had more freedom in El Dorado than I did Winfield because of all the stuff that I did in the prison. The groups that I was involved with, the JCs, working gym and yard, teaching classes in the band room. I could be in the band room every day of the week in El Dorado. And the quality of the instruments was better than the quality of the instruments in Winfield. So... There was just a lot more for me in El Dorado. There was also not a religious call out for me in Winfield. I was the head of the Thelema call out in El Dorado and Winfield didn't even have one. So, you know, it was one of those things. So I didn't have that community around me in Winfield that I did in El Dorado and I didn't have as many things to do. I didn't like the other inmates that were there. I didn't like the staff that was there. So yeah, I, I didn't really like Winfield. And everything came to a head in February of 2016. I was told that my shower shoes had finally came in from canteen that I ordered, you know, several months prior. And I needed to go to property first thing in the morning to turn in my old shower shoes and get my new ones. So I went over there and I went to turn in my old shower shoes and... The same officer that I had had problems with who had talked about my mother was the property officer who I had to get my shoes from. And, you know, I handed him my old shower shoes and he's looking at him and he's like, well, your number isn't on these shower shoes. Your name and number isn't on here. And I explained to him that Miss Glover had just left A and D on the shower shoes because... I was supposed to have shower shoes coming the next week when I got them. And he said, no, we don't do that. You stole these. I said, man, I didn't steal the shower shoes. And at that time I had, you know, close to $2,000 on my books. And, you know, so I'm like, I don't need these shower shoes. Why would I need to steal shower shoes? I have close to $2,000 on my books right now. Those shower shoes cost like $1.50. Yeah, I did not need to steal shower shoes. He's like, oh, no, none of that matters. You stole these. And it was in retaliation for that grievance I filed against him. And I said, look, man, I'm telling you that I didn't steal the shower shoes. He said, I don't care what you're telling me. You're a liar. And that kind of flipped my idiot switch. I really don't like people insulting my integrity and this guy and I had already had issues and I said stop calling me a liar and he said no I'm gonna call you a liar because that's what you are you're lying so you're a liar and he started getting belligerent about it 
you know, he started raising his voice and he starts yelling at me. And I said, no, you need to stop yelling at me. And he got louder. You know, he said, I can yell at you if I want to. You're an inmate. I'm calling you a liar. I said, look, and he's, he's leaning over this counter because there was a counter there in property. He's leaning over the counter, jabbing his finger in my face. And he is yelling and he is so close to me that I can feel drops of spit hit me in, on the face, you know. I lost my shit. I mean, I'm sorry for my language, but I lost my shit. I went off on that dude. I yelled at him. I said, you better get your fucking finger out of my face and quit calling me a liar before I come across that counter and I beat your goddamn ass. That's exactly what I said. And he hit the panic button. Officers in prison have a radio and it has a panic button on it. Basically, they hit that button and all their friends come running. And that's exactly what happened. He hit that button. I didn't try to run. But he didn't say another word. He shut up immediately. He just hit that button. All of his friends came running. <clears throat> So all of his friends show up. They asked what happened. I told him. And he's like, oh, no, that didn't happen. I didn't call him a liar. I said, you did call me a liar. And the reason why you're so pissed off is I filed that grievance against you because you were talking bad about my mother, which was an exaggeration on my part. He wasn't talking bad about my mother per se. His exact words were, your mommy didn't teach you how to tell what size shoes you wear insulting my intelligence and talking about my mother anyway so they asked what happened i give my side of the story he kind of denied my side of the story and just said that i went off on him because he accused me of stealing shoes and threatened to beat him up and at that point the officers were like well you're gonna go to the hole and you're probably going to max custody because threatening and intimidating is a class one R1 right up in the Kansas prison system straight to max custody and you will stay at max custody for three years. At that point, it was 2016. I was getting out in 2018. That meant that I was going to be max for the remainder of my sentence. So they had to take me to the captain's office before they did that and they needed to cuff me up and take me to the hole. And as they were cuffing me up and, you know, I, uh, at first, I was kind of just numb, you know, because I'm thinking, man, I've been working since 2007 to get to minimum, and it's all about to be pissed away over this piece of shit, you know? And they got one cuff on me, and then I just fucking, I, I flipped, you know? I, I said, cuff me up, that's what you do, and I pulled away from that cop, and he had the other handcuff in his hand, and cuffs have a, a little point on them. It's not super sharp, but it's a point. And when I pulled away, that point on the end of the handcuffs uh, cut into his hand. Not super bad, but it cut him pretty good, I guess. You know, he didn't need stitches, I don't think, but he was cut. <clears throat> I pulled away from him, and then I tried to go over that counter and make good on my promise to that property officer. And he took off running. He went in the back office and locked himself in there. And I'm trying to pull myself over this counter. And in the meantime, I have these, all these cops that are grabbing onto me. I want to say it was about five of them. And we wrestled. They couldn't even get me away from the counter at first. I was trying to pull myself over. It wasn't working. Finally, they just picked me up and they slammed me down on the tile floor, landed on my face. Knocked my chin pretty good, split my, my chin open, and uh, dislocated my jaw, which I wouldn't learn about till later. Still have problems with it, but we wrestled for a while. They were trying to put me in handcuffs, and I wasn't having it. Um, one of them took a can of mace and put it right in my face and said, I'm going to spray you. You know, and another one had a taser. They were getting ready to tase me, and... You know, I don't like mace. I, I really don't like mace. 
especially being an asthmatic. I I can't stand that shit. And I called it, uh, you know, I called it at that point. I gave up. <laughs> Figured I was fighting a losing battle. And, you know, they took me to the captain's office and they said I was probably looking at battery on an LEO in addition to threatening and intimidating. I was looking at new charges. And they, uh, you know, after I calmed down, I apologized to the dude that I cut because I really wasn't trying to hurt the officer. Not him anyway. I was trying to hurt the property officer, not the guy who was trying to restrain me. That dude was just doing his job. The property officer was being a dick. But I was pretty defeated, you know, looking at new charges and stuff. And, man, marched me off to the hole to await my disciplinary hearing and to figure out what would happen to me. And I'm going to leave it off right there because my camera battery is dying and this seems like a good stopping point. But thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate all you guys. I know I haven't been putting out as many videos lately. You know, bear with me. I have a lot of stuff going on in my life right now. Um, but I love you all. And I really do appreciate your time. Whether you're subscribed or if you're just watching this, I appreciate it. This has been another episode of From Prison to the Streets. I'm Eric. I will see you all later.